Hello. Yeah, so that this talk is about things that I learned, uh, which, you know, maybe you've seen the acronym, although the first thing I found when searching for what, for researching this talk, let's say, is that things I learned, what I always thought was things I learned, actually some people think it's today I learned. That's not quite right, in my opinion. Um, I didn't learn, these aren't, this isn't about things I learned today, but it's about things I've learned over the last eight years or so working as a, you know, professional language designer, uh, which it feels a little bit strange to say that that's my job title, because I feel like that sounds like I belong in this august group of, and I was really sad making this slide because I had to leave off so many awesome people. Um, and I don't think that's true. But I have learned a few things, uh, and I've been in the course of working on Rust and before that, and I thought some of them might be interesting. So I've been working on Rust f since 2011. I went there after my PhD. That's me at the time. That's Mozilla's dinosaur that used to be in our office, and that was my, my daughter, who was three months old. And uh, that makes it easy for me to tell kind of how long I've been working on Rust, because this is like roughly how old she is. Um, but so like the first thing I would say is, you know, if you're going to change, or move to a new city to take up a new job, doing it at the same time as you have a new child, like, might not be the least stressful way to go about it, but it all worked out in the end. You know, I'm now living in, in Boston, and I guess that kind of brings me to like the very first thing that I've learned, and that's not just in this job, but also through the course of the PhD, I guess, is that there, when people present you some kind of research, and you see how impressive it is, they probably didn't take a very straight and simple path to get there. So if you're feeling a little unsure what you're doing at some point, it's OK. It's normal, right? I mean, I know when I would see a presentation at a conference or something, and they walk in, and they've got like the introduction just right. They have the motivation. They've, they show you how it directly connects to the thing they're doing and the results. That's great, but what they don't tell you is that like three to six months ago, they were sort of like, oh my god, <laughs> how is this thing going to work? Is it going to work at all? Where, what are we doing? Um, and this has more or less been true for Rust for sure. So you know, if, if I talk about Rust today, I have a pretty polished presentation I've given a few times, which has, you know, emphasizes this sort of language with a minimal core, the type system based on ownership and borrowing and traits, these ideas. Uh, from academia that we're deploying, building on C++'s zero-cost abstractions with a very minimal footprint so that the core language is kind of relatively small and simple and has few dependencies. And then you can layer on all these other things, like uh, simple data structures, vectors, hash maps, and so on, all the way up to you know, work-stealing runtimes and so on. Right? And I think it worked out pretty nice. I'm happy with how the language has turned out so far. Uh, it lets you do cool things, like write ergonomic code like this. For those of you who don't know Rust, I figured there might be a few. I thought I'd give a few examples, not too much. Um, this is a dot product. It takes two vectors, iterates over them in lockstep, multiplies, sums it up. And you know, if you write this kind of high-level code and then compile it, thanks to those zero-cost abstraction techniques from C++, you will wind up with a nice vectorized loop. At least it worked the last time I tried it. Um, and that's pretty cool, right? And then you can do things like change it to run in parallel, in which case you get a work stealing scheduler and each work, each particular worker doing the loops. And the nice parlor trick here is we can also do this safely, right? So if you modify this code to, say, mutate a counter, we'll detect that, as, as we covered in the last section, actually. And we'll, we'll notify you that there's a data race here and that you can't modify a counter from two distinct threads at once. You should use some sort of synchronization. So that's really cool. But if you came to Rust, well, if, if, if you look back to where Rust started, it was very different, right? We didn't really know what we were doing, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, and so a lot of this stuff right here, this, these days sort of predate me, actually. Uh, the Rust the project started a couple years before I got involved. But at that time, it had like a runtime with Erlang-like tasks that couldn't share any data, a garbage collector. It used all functional data structures for its vectors and hash maps, sort of like Swift with copy on write semantics. And ownership and so forth only got added to the language as basically a performance optimization on top of those vectors, saying it was too hard to predict when copies would occur, so we should enforce unique uh, ownership statically, and then gradually grew to kind of become the core of the language as it is today. Right? And along the way, 
uh, like when I got there, it was still not sound at, in remotely, by which I mean you could easily crash it. There wasn't really a borrow checker. And we knew that that was like a to-do item, right? Uh, and the first versions, it went through several iterations, right, to get to the one we have now. Um, kind of each time taking an existing code base, porting it over, seeing how did it feel, uh, and trying it out. And the first versions didn't have this notion of, in particular, they allowed, you would declare fields to be mutable, but then you could mutate them through any path that could reach that field, right? Much like OCaml or much like Java, except that in Java you declare fields to be final and not so the inverse default. But, and that made for a language that was actually pretty hard to use in practice. But something we, wasn't really obvious from small examples. You had to really use it at scale to realize how annoying it would be. And the problem was that, for example, if you were iterating over a, a vector, if someone's appending to that vector through some other alias, they're going to invalidate your iteration. So we required you to move it to the stack so that you knew. You basically had to swap it with an empty vector or something so that we could be sure it was a unique path. Um, and so that, that didn't work out as well. And eventually, we changed it. Right? And this kind of brought us to Rust today. Um, and the system at that time was known by this crazy acronym, Imhet Wama, which we had a penchant for weird acronyms. It, it came from my blog post where I proposed the idea. Uh, and it was just like a misremembered acronym based on the title of this, because it doesn't actually match up very well. Um, <laughs> but it was fun, right? And so this is where Rust was. And, and it, it took us several years to get there. At the same time, we were iterating on other axes, like generic programming and threads and runtime, uh, sort of gradually moving that runtime out into libraries and getting, taking threads out of the language, extending its capabilities for generics. And so the thing that was always true right, was that we kind of had a pretty good idea of what we wanted to make, something that was fast, something that was safe and correct, and that could actually be used to replace code in Firefox. Um, and I think that, that's kind of the key point, is the path you take to the end result will probably be very windy, but it's good if you have a sort of general idea to lead you in the direction, right? And along the way, you should be really open, right? So I put this here about the code of conduct and so on. That applies to like a big open source project. But I think the general idea is that um, don't be sure you have the right answer. <laughs> I try to, if people come with other ideas, listen to it, hear it out. Uh, and try to evaluate it, right? And that's, that's kind of my, my general take on research. And I was a bit intrigued because this sounds a lot like something that uh, I heard yesterday. I think, I think Anders pre presented it about my, my basic feeling for the only way to do research that's ever worked for me is something that I kind of call the research spiral for reasons uh, that I'll explain in a second, where you, you kind of have a goal you do something that's not very clear in the middle, right? And that not very clear thing is kind of, you basically just try to reproduce what already exists and try to do the thing you're doing and see. And somewhere along the way, some ideas come, right, that are different. A way, a differentiator, a problem that, you, that the other system had that you didn't realize at first that takes you in a different direction. Um, and I find this sort of relaxing because you don't have to know the, the whole path in advance. Um, the reason I call it a spiral is that usually, in my experience, you start here, you kind of do something you're really excited about, it seems to be taking you somewhere, and you keep following it, and you sort of seem like you've ended up back where you started after a while, but hopefully, hopefully you're not exactly where you started, and you keep going, and it sort of takes you in. Anyway, um, uh, but one thing that I learned <laughs> while we were going through this spiral on Rust is that you know, there's this saying from, from uh, what's his name, Jobs, true artists ship, right? That at some point, you can always make it better, but at some point you have to sort of say, okay, we did something, right, that we can send out and try to get people to get excited about and, and use. Um, and it's, it's a little difficult because, especially I think language designers, we have this perfectionist tendency, which is what this GIF is supposed to get across, to always make everything better and find every little problem and see if you can, you can fix it. Um, but, you know, that just leads to essentially things never leaving your laptop in the end. Uh, and I think it's much better to put it out there, get feedback, iterate on it, and see what you can do about fixing it. Um, so one of the things that we did around 2014, we'd been working on Rust for many years, and it was clear that at some point, like, we had to declare this language stable or no one was ever going to use it. 
right? Uh, and even though we knew there were lots of flaws and imperfections. So we had to come up with a system that would let us do that, part, take the stable parts that we were happy with, but keep working on the other parts and evolve it, right? Um, and so the thing we ended up with, I think, is a nice scheme. And if you're a part of a project that you, know, that you wanted to do a similar task, you might adopt something similar to it, which was basically that we had these, we have these release channels where we say, OK, the code is stable. We have a, a stable channel where you can go and get the latest version of the compiler. Um, it's released every six weeks. And everything on there is sort of guaranteed to be forwards compatible. And that's because we don't allow you to access the things that we're not sure about. And those things that we're not sure about, you can, you can use only if you use the nightly release. Um, and that comes out every night. Uh, and not only do you have to use the nightly compiler, but you have to opt in and say, I want to use this unstable feature. I know that it might change under my feet, and my code might stop compiling. That's OK. I, I want to try it out. Right? And the big, the big thing that we sort of knew we wanted these feature gates, but the big change that we made that was not entirely obvious to me was that you could only use them on nightly. So at first we thought, we will, we'll just let them be used anywhere. We're all adults here. If you say feature foo, then and even though you're on a stable compiler, you know that you're, you're uh, you're opting into this instability. The problem with that was that then people can write libraries that encapsulate the instability for you, and that sort of you don't know that, you, that they're using in their library some feature gate. And that doesn't sound bad at first. It seems good. Encapsulation is good. The problem is that uh, if the a new version of the compiler comes out, you as a consumer, you're using somebody's library. That library no longer builds because it was using an unstable feature. Now, your code is broken because of somebody else's code, and it's just kind of a super annoying thing. Uh, if you're looking for stability, you don't want that. You want to th all the way down the chain. So the kind of generalization here, well, so we wound up making feature gates infectious in this way. And I think I would say the generalization, the thing that I've kind of seen happen a lot of times, this is one example, is that you know it's good to issue warnings. It's good to tell people what's going on. But if you really think it's important, people don't care. <laughs> uh, they got stuff to do. They got problems. They know that it's, it's serious. You need to send them like a strong message, one that is sort of unmistakable. Um, and so that's what the feature gates were aiming to do. And I think they've been successful. Um, and it's come up in other places, too. Right? So we have, for example, uh, well, this is our message, basically. Right? The, strong, the strong and simple message is, if you're using nightly, your code might stop compiling. Um, if you can use stable, you don't have that problem. But other places that this has come up, I would say, is around, for example, around bugs. So we have a policy that we try not to break your code, but we also have a policy that we like to fix bugs. And those things sometimes come in conflict, because maybe our type checker was accepting something it wasn't supposed to, and you wrote some code that relied on that without realizing it. So what we do in those cases is if, there, if we find that there's a bug that we have to fix that affects a non-trivial amount of code, uh, we try to issue a future compatibility warning for a little while. And the idea is you'll get warnings. It'll say, hey, in a few, in a few releases or six months or something, this code is going to stop compiling, so maybe you want to change it. And these have been pretty successful, but they've definitely been subject to this problem of people wait. <laughs> They, they know it's coming, but they're not inclined to act so promptly necessarily. Right? And so we've often had to go on sort of proactive campaigns, going searching GitHub, finding people's projects, submitting PRs, saying, like, we really don't want to break your project, but we are going to fix this bug. Um, it's kind of neat that we can do that. Like, open source is, is wacky and cool. Of course, it doesn't work if, if you don't put your code out in the wild. Um, but it's been, a, it's been an interesting thing for us, trying to keep this policy and how to get it sufficiently annoying but not too annoying, and especially trying to avoid the problem of sort of, I'm, com I'm getting warnings about code that isn't really under my control, and I can't fix them. I don't, uh, that, that happens sometimes if some of your dependencies, for example, are using features they shouldn't use. So there's a lot of considerations there. Uh, and the last thing we've done, which is not special to us, but it is definitely useful, is with something we call additions. So, I said that at 1.0, we were going to declare certain parts of the language stable. But of course, over time, you realize there are things you might like to do that, that would slightly break that. The simplest version is adding a keyword to the grammar. Now, if you add a new keyword and somebody had used it as a variable name, you, you kind of break their code, even though they uh, uh, 
It doesn't seem, it seems like a very trivial change. So what we do there is we can basically tag Rust code with a version. So you can say it's 2015 Rust code, that's the default, the old stuff. Or 2018, that's the new stuff. And that toggles whether something's a keyword, right? The Java does something similar when they introduce the enum keyword, for example. And many C++ compilers have this. Um, but it's been a pretty nice, I think we're, we're happy. We'll see, we've only done one so far. Um, but we plan to be using these additions not only to group together changes, but to tell a larger story about sort of how Rust has evolved. Um, Anyway, uh, so that's kind of the history of Rust and some of the project management side of it. But I wanted to go a little bit into some of the things that came up in the design of the language itself that they weren't very obvious to me to start. And I think, um, and they're not things that arise necessarily totally naturally from a from a like a core calculus that you might not see it. So one of them is to think about versioning, and by versioning, I, I don't mean versioning of the language necessarily, but rather what happens to code as it changes. Like it can, basically right now when you, when you make a proof of soundness for your type system or something, what you're showing is that the type checker applied to some code at this point in time you know, can prove the code doesn't have problems. But what you're not necessarily thinking about is what if someone edits the code? Um, that, what kinds of edits will cause the code to stop compiling? And should we be worried about that? So let me give you an example. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to use this language. How many people here have heard of semantic versioning? OK, most of you, but not all. But th this is basically just a way to number, to number libraries, right? And it came out at some point because people were using crazy numbers that told them nothing. Uh, and now the idea is that if you say the big number, the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, those are major compatibility points. And as you go forward within a particular version, like from 0.0 to 1.1, you should be forwards compatible. Right? You can add new features, but you can't take away the old stuff um, or change it. So the question really is, like, what kinds of changes can I make? If I, if I have a library, what kind of changes can I make and still issue a minor version? So if I had 1.0, what can I change and still call it 1.1? And when do I have to call it 2.0? Because I broke potentially some of my clients. And this is kind of a tricky thing to answer. Like, this, this spec is sort of a template, but it doesn't really answer that question. Like, if you fix a bug, do you need a new major release? Because now you change the behavior of a function that used to exist? Probably not, but maybe, depending, right? Um, so one place this came up for us, I think the first time that I sort of actively noticed this, uh, had to do with traits. So Rust traits are similar to Haskell's type classes, or they have really, basically a trait is kind of like an interface in Java, if that's more familiar. But it defines a bunch of methods and operations that a type should support. And so you can say, for example, I have a hash trait for things that are hashable, and then I can have my hash set, and it can take any key as long as it's hashable. Right? And when I, I then define or implement this trait for different types. So if I have a, well, here I made a struct named u32. I don't, I don't know why I did that, because that's Rust built-in integer type. But let's say you had a struct with some name, like u32. Then you could implement hash for it, right? And then you're just defining your, your hash. Um, and uh, and so the, the, the problem is we only want, we want to know Part of Rust design is, is that for any given trait and any given type, there should only be at most one impl that applies. Right? So if you think about hash sets, it wouldn't be very good. You don't want to have two different ways to hash the same type. Because if you did, then, for example, I might construct a hash set using one of those techniques. Um, and then I might take that hash set in some other place and try to use it using the other hashing implementation. And if they're not the same, then you know, the values are, I mean, I get, I'm not going to find things in my hash table that I was supposed to find. And so we called this the hash table problem when we were hashing it out, no pun intended. But like, it's a well-known problem. Uh, and in, in Haskell, they call this coherence. And we've sort of adopted this term, too, that basically that you want to have a, a coherent notion of what a hash is right, that holds together across your whole program. And you could do this in various ways, but the way we chose to do it was to impose a global constraint that says you can't ever have two impulse 
uh, of, of the trait for, for the same type. Right? And this is like a key word, this global constraint. Anytime a constraint applies across all, like the entire program and all libraries, there's a, sem there's, there's a sort of semver hazard, as we'll see. Um, and the, the, the basic idea of this is kind of simple. You say, OK, well, we ha so we have these things called crates. They're just libraries, just modules like distributed separately. And you say, OK, within one of those crates, we can just check for overlap. We just look at all the impulse and make sure they're not the same. But across crates, we'll use this thing called the orphan rule. And what the orphan rule said is, basically, the crate must define either the trait or the type. And it, that, that means that any given implementation, you can kind of tell where it is. Because if you defined the trait, then there can't be anything wherever you got the type from, it can't have def supplied the implementation because it didn't know about that trait. Well, we have a DAG relationship. That's important. But if you define the type, then similarly, nobody could have implemented the trait because they didn't know about your type. And so this seems sufficient. Um, now, this, this will catch, you know, the, the tricky part comes in. It's not so much the orphan rule, but this part. I said that, OK, so we can ignore other, other compilation units we don't have to worry so much about right now. But within one crate, we still want to just check for duplicates. Right? And some cases are really easy. Like if we just write the same thing twice in a row, uh, obviously overlaps. But when you get into more complicated relationships between traits or more generic implementations of traits, then you start to be a little less trivial. So imagine we had a trait for things that can be converted into an integer. And we called it as u32. And then suppose we implemented hash for u32, but separately, we implemented it for anything that could be converted into an integer. Now, this so far, just this alone is actually just fine, because we never actually implemented the as u32 trait for u32. So indeed, you can't convert a u32 into itself. Uh, so these two impulses are disjoint, and we can accept them um, as not overlapping. Right? But there's a kind of, that's a little surprising. Maybe we, maybe we released this as version 1.0 of our library. But it's a little bit surprising, because um, we probably did intend to implement the as u32 trade for u32. We just forgot to do so. And then if we were to add it at some later time, then we would create an overlap between these two impulses that were otherwise OK. Uh, and that's the kind of scenario that we were getting worried about. So actually, I got a little ahead of my slides. But um, the idea was, initially, or we added support. Basically, we wanted the ability to write these kind of flexible impulses that said, initially, we only supported really simple things like this. And we wanted to add support for these more flexible kinds. Right? And we did that in an RFC. Uh, which is our way of proposing and describing changes. And we were kind of ready to ship this for 1.0 when we realized this problem that I was describing to you. And in particular, we realized that the way that this problem would manifest. So if you imagine I have a crate, the first crate, this are, these are, imagine these are two different libraries. And the first one defines this trait and defines some type, but doesn't implement the trait for the type. And then in the second one, we define the trait hash, and we implement it for anything that can be converted to a u32. And then we implement it for this type also, because this type doesn't implement as u32, and we want to make it hashable. These are all allowed by the orphan rule, and there's no overlap. Right? There's no problem here. But now the problem is this original crate, maybe they would like to implement that trait for my type right, in their next version. And so, the, so essentially, now what would happen if we allowed this as a minor update, if they said, this is version 1.1, is that crate 2 would stop compiling. Right? Um, and that, that seemed bad, because we knew sort of the definition of a minor update should be that you extend your functionality. You just do more. But here, we were just extending the functionality of my type so that it could be converted to integers. And yet we broke people's code downstream, because essentially they were, they were assuming some negative reasoning. Right? They were basically assuming in this bit of code that's only allowed because we know that that type does not implement that trait. Um, 
And so what we did, what we wound up doing is applying similar logic, uh, the orphan rule logic kind of here again, and saying you can't assume that some type does not implement a trait unless you would be the one to supply that impl. Right? So if, if you own uh, either the trait or the type, then you can make that assumption, but otherwise you can't. Um, and that was this proposal, re-rebalancing or rebalancing. But what's, it came out in March, end of March. You probably can't read, but March 31st. And we released 1.0 in May. <laughs> so you can see it was like at the last minute. So I was like in the shower or something, and I said, oh my god. If we do this, people are just going to be stuck. They're not going to be able to add new impulse to any of their libraries. Um, that's not going to work. Or actually, I think the way it came up, no, I remember now. It came up because we did this. We added an impl to a type and broke people's code. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> something's wrong here. We should be able to do that. Um, so, so this is actually still a problem, I would say. I'm not very happy with our coherence rules. Um, so maybe another thing I learned is you know, global constraints are just hard to balance out. Uh, this is a place we're still iterating, but I think at least we have the the basic shape, right? right. Um, and there are some other examples that came up around this. So like in earlier versions of the language, one, one of them has to do, so, so Rust has this notion of ownership, which we saw, that if you have a resource with a destructor, it, it has moved from place to place, and the compiler tracks who owns it. But we also have types that are not owned. We call them copyable types, like integers. But also, you could. You can imagine you want not just the basic integers, but like maybe this struct point, which has two integers in it. It should also be copyable. I mean, that's, that's just basically a 64-bit integer. Um, and so what we used to do is just figure that out implicitly. We said, well, we'll look at what's in it. And if it is all copyable things, then it, too, will be copyable um, automatically. And it was very convenient in a way. Um, so you could write code like this that allocates the point and then copies it over, and then I can still continue to use both of these variables. But the problem here, um, the problem was there is an implicit assumption, right, that, that nobody really declared anywhere. But what's, what's, by allowing this function to compile, what we are implicitly saying is point will always be copy. It's copy now, and it's going to stay copy. I'm not going to be allowed to add new fields with new data that might not um, be copy as well. So like if I wanted to extend point with a vector or a piece of ref counted data, because you can't copy a ref count because it requires mutating the bytes, so it's not literally a mem copy, um, we would, that would be a breaking change to my clients. And so we got worried about that. And now we require an explicit declaration if you want to be copyable. Um, and that's why. We haven't been 100% consistent. Um, so we have, for example, a trait that determines if your, if your objects are thread safe. And that one we do do automatically still, meaning that it is a summer breaking change to convert your code from thread safe to not thread safe. Um, the reason we thought that was a good idea, and I think it has proven to be true. Well, before I get there, let me just give you an example of when that might come up. Um, so we have, for example, uh, so, so let me first explain what the send trait is for those of you who don't do Rust. So the send trait is basically a marker that says this type is safe to send between threads. And what it really means is that the type owns transitively all the data that it, it has access to. Um, and, or in another way, that uh, the type doesn't permit data races when it's moved from thread to thread. Right? And it's usually true, actually. For almost all Rust types, it, it's kind of true. But there are some where it's not. And a classic example would be the RC type. This is a reference counted box, right? So this type represents a vector stored in the heap with a ref count attached to it. And the reason that's not thread safe is that if you increment that ref count, you have to use special instructions to do a thread safe increment. And those are more expensive. And sometimes people would like to do non thread safe increments because they're cheaper and because the data isn't going across threads. And then we have a separate type, atomic reference count that does the atomic instructions. So the top one is send, or not send, but the lower one is, because it's OK to move. Uh, in both cases, you have two. You, you can potentially have many handles to the same ref-counted data. But in one case, 
the handle will only do atomic operations, and in the other it will it will not. Right. Um, so we def we define send automatically. So that means, like I said earlier, that means if I define a context and it has a hash map in it, we're basically assuming that in the future you will not change that hash map to RC of hash map. You could change it to ARC. That would be okay. Um, and it's not obvious that that makes sense. And we debated about it for a while. We wound up deciding this way because, in practice, idiomatically we observed that libraries were tend to not use RC very often. And if they do use it, they tend to use it from the start, basically. Um, and so it wasn't a common kind of change. And it was OK to make it not a breaking change. Um, and we also wanted parallelism to be enabled very deeply, because that was kind of one of the selling points of Rust, was you follow this ownership protocol, you get to use parallelism everywhere. And if we had a lot of, if you needed to manually specify whether things were thread safe, you might find that you can't, not because it wouldn't work, but because somebody just forgot to, to opt in. Um, and so it was kind of a bet that this would not be a big deal in practice. I would be interested to go back, and I haven't done this, look over the data now that we have data of how often do people actually make changes uh, that break this? But what I can say is I've never heard anyone complain very much about it. <laughs> so that at least means it's not, it's worked out okay. Um, there's a lot more versioning cases. Uh, and I think there, I think it would be nice to try to elaborate on what are the, what are the criteria you should use whenever you have to make a decision like this? Um, and how can you see them ahead of time and realize what the danger is? Uh, so another thing I learned is that simple is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, maybe I sort of knew this already, but I, I've, I've gained some appreciation for it. And what I mean by that is that you know it, it's obvious, I guess, if you think of like the lambda calculus, it's, it's very simple in the sense that it can be defined in like three lines of LaTeX. Uh, but if you actually tried to build a program at scale, of course, you would find it very challenging. It's kind of an ex you would find it very hard to use. That's a simple example, but of the notion that mm, the, the simpler the language is to a certain extent, the harder it can be to use and vice versa, but not quite. Right? And this has come up a few times in Rust, and we've been wrestling around it. it because Rust is trying to do advanced analyses, right? And many of us had experience with using tools like, I don't know, Coverity and things like this, so these kind of, uh, or, or Valgrind, these sort of approximate analyses that come in, analyze your, your program, and, and point out possible bugs to you. But they're, they're always over approximations. And you can't quite tell why it's suggesting this to you sometimes. right? It'll say, mm, maybe there's an uninitialized memory here. And maybe it's right, and maybe it's not. But you have to sort of figure out, why did it think that that might be true? And is it possibly really true? Um, so we wanted a system that would be simpler than that. Right? The part of the appeal of a type checker is, yes, it's an approximation, but its mechanism is sort of clear to you so that you can actually refine the program and not get errors. And we started out, so we, we talked about borrowing a little bit earlier, but we started out with this, this borrowing mechanism that was sort of coarser than necessary because we thought it would be easier for people to use it since they would understand it better. The mechanisms were simpler. In particular, if you borrowed a value and, say, stored it into a local variable, the borrow would extend all the way till the end of the block. Right? So I create a reference to v, and it would extend all the way till the end of the block when p goes out of scope, even if we're not using the reference again. Right? And in this case, we never use the reference at all. Um, and the idea was basically that the scope of a borrow, the, the lifetime, the, the length of a borrow, was always tied to blocks and lexical structure of the program. Um, and that seemed simpler to me. It did not seem simpler to anybody else, I think, <laughs> who tried to use Rust. Like, what would happen in practice is you would get this intuition for, OK, I get it. So long as the data is shared, I can't mutate it. But then you would try to hear you would say, but it's not shared. I don't understand. Like, why, why are you giving me this error? And it's exactly, I think, this problem that, uh, or an instance, it, it was exactly the experience was very similar, I guess I would say, to the coverity thing, which is kind of that in practice, you couldn't quite tell why it was telling you that anyway. And so I think my, my conclusion from this was that simpler is good, but not at the cost of precision. 
uh, somehow. There's like some kind of balance you have to strike. It has to be sufficiently precise to match the intuition that people have. So we've changed this. It turned out to be really, really hard to change, much harder than I expected. It took us like two years or more, many years actually. But it's now changed. It seems, and now we now have a much more flow sensitive algorithm, uh, and hopefully we're going to get more sensitive still. The reason it took so long was a combination of, it turned out that this was sim implementation challenges, so using these lexical blocks was a lot faster and simpler to implement, and that there were some other things in the analysis that it, some other, that they kind of, because they were so over approximated, they masked some other challenges that arose when we tried to make them more precise. So I think it was probably an okay call to start simple, but it, it was not easier to understand, right? It's easier to just have a notion of, that includes control flow uh, and so forth. And something else that we've learned over time um, is that error messages are really the first teacher and often the only teacher, I think, that people get, right? We like to imagine, I guess, that people are sitting down and taking out the Rust book and starting from chapter one and reading all the way to chapter 10 or whatever and, and understanding everything in, in precisely the order that we intended for them to learn it. But actually, right, they're just, they just want to get started no matter what happens, right? They want to write some code. Uh, and I'm the same way. Like, every time I, I uh, get a new computer or something, I, like, for example, I try to use PowerShell on this Windows. I have no idea how PowerShell works. 25% of the time, my commands do what I expect, and I have st still yet to read the manual, right? Um, so we've been trying pretty hard, and I think it's been paying off for us to put a lot of effort into our error messages. Maybe you can read this, maybe you can't. I think this is one of the ones that most directly tries to teach people. So what it does is it looks, we have this, this println thing in our compiler, which is like printf in C. It sort of prints out, uh, you, it prints out strings, and you can embed, you can use placeholders like saying, you know, put this string here, put this number here. And people often coming from C would use the string, no the C notation of percent %s to mark where a string should go, or percent %d to mark where an integer should go. And we now detect that. That's not the Rust notation, but we detect it and tell you, you know, by the way, that's not how you do it. Here's how it would look in Rust if you were to do it correctly. Um, and we have a lot of things like this where we look for mistakes that people are making, and we sort of target exactly that mistake and try to suggest to them what they should do. And this has been pretty effective for us. I think we, there are, there is, there's actually good research on this. Uh, for example, this paper, uh, from, which is, a lot of it has been done in the, in the context of Racket. And it shows some places where I think we could go and haven't gone as well as we should. Um, like the importance of looking over all the vocabulary that you use and making it consistent uh, and checking whether people actually understand when you say things like function definition, what a definition is, right? Which a lot of people don't. Um, and helping people map these concepts. So I think this is really cool and exciting. Uh, I would like us to do much more, but, but I'm proud of like how much we've done so far. And one thing you'll note, if you can see this, one part of that was we just spent a lot of time changing how we formatted our error messages, right? Um, and it was a good investment, I think. But. So another thing um, that I've learned or relearned over time is you should really de-sugar in your compiler. <laughs> um, so many compilers will teach you this for sure in like a compiler course or something, that you can gradually lower your representation uh, and simplify your program into, into low, simplifying constructs, and that seems like pretty basic knowledge. However, people often don't do it as much as they should, and in particular, the Rust compiler, well, at least when I got there, there was a kind of ethos that we don't do that, right? which I found surprising at first, but the reasoning was your error messages will be less good. Uh, it basically, you're going to start expressing your error messages in terms of the desugaring and not in terms of the original program, and, uh, and that is true. That is a hard problem. But the result, we, but for, for much too long, we kind of kept this, even as the language got more complicated. And the result was that we just had all of these really subtle bugs, um, many of which were not obvious to me that they would arise at first. Right? So I think, in particular, around the flow sensitive, the borrow checking kind of logic, the checks that your ownership and borrowing is correct, we hit these problems. Because what would happen is I had implemented a sort of abstraction that would essentially construct a control flow graph, essentially do a, a lowering, 
just for the purposes of the analysis. And it would, it would construct this from the AST, and then we had that representation. But then separately, we would lower the AST down to LLVMIR later on and execute. And sometimes the ordering of those two didn't match like we thought it would. Um, so we would have, the, I don't think we ever actually had this bug, but you, you, know, you might have, especially around match statements, you might have bugs where uh, we would fail to, uh, to recognize a problem just because we were not quite realizing the order of operations. And so in this case, the problem would be I've constructed an option with a string in it, and I'm matching a borrow of that, which means I'm basically getting out a reference to the string that's inside the option, and then I'm overwriting the option with none. That's going to free the string that's in the option, but I still have this reference, right? And if I went to go on and use it, that would be a bug. Um, and sometimes we would fail to recognize these sorts of things. Oh, I have a picture. Um, this is the idea. Like the, 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 the optional, an option on the stack might be represented as like two fields. Actually, it would be one, but because of optimizations. But uh, and we'd have a pointer to the data that's inside it, right? Um, so what we do now is we introduce the new IR that we call MIR, the middle IR. And the idea is that before we run our analysis, we'll we'll desugar this match. So we're going to convert it to these really simple operations. In particular, where we used to have this big tree structure, we now have a bunch of tests. So we'll say things like load the discriminant, basically load whether this is a sum or a none. Is it, is it is there or not? And then if it's one or the other, branch to the right place. Yep. Sorry? Uh, yeah. So, so the question was, does it work with nullable pointers? So what, the thing is that we optimize for these options. If you have an option of a nullable pointer or of a reference, that can't be null. So instead of storing that as two words, one that's like, is it there or not, and then the pointer separately, we just collapse it into one, and we use null to represent the case where it's not there. Right? And we'll actually do that quite, quite uh, deeply. So if you have an option of a string, inside the string is also a pointer to the character data, and we might. Um, we might use that instead, so it doesn't take up more space. And the answer is, yeah, it does. This is the mirror is uh, that's basically part of the discriminant operation. Is loading the discriminant knows if it has a different representation, it's kind of abstracted away. Um, but the nice thing about this is we have this one source now that encodes the control flow in a pretty simple way, and we can check it for c correctness, and we can also generate code from it, like the L of M I R. And we're not going to make these same kind of mistakes, right? Because it's so close to both of them. So that was really useful to us. Uh, it's actually, we're still transitioning to this. This closed, I don't know how many bugs. Um, I mean, most of them are very obscure. You had to do a lot of work to reproduce them, but it closed probably like 10 or 20 bugs uh, of subtle ways that you could get the control flow messed up. And we're still now in a warning period about it, actually. So I was mentioning those future compatibility warnings. Right now, what we do is we run the new checker, and if the checker thinks your code is OK, then we let it go. But if the checker thinks there's an error, then we run the old checker. And if the old checker also thought there was an error, then we'll print the error. But otherwise, we print it as a warning. Um, so it's a little bit, sometimes we have to really work to produce these future compatibility warnings. But um, so as a side note, like I think doing these desugarings, one thing I've been finding very useful is expressing them in basically logic programming <laughs> wherever I can. Anytime I have an analysis, if I can express it as data log or something like that, it's much easier for me to iterate and play with it. So if you haven't messed with, pro with logic programming, I think you should, uh, especially if you're doing program analysis. Even if you don't use it for your final implementation, um, it's a nice way to iterate fast. And I will highlight souffle, especially as I have some Oracle people here, but that's OK. <laughs> I, don't think you have, I don't know if you have anything to do with it, though, uh, because it's awesome and a really great tool for So like, when designing this analysis, this, this, this new version of the analysis, I remember I was on an airplane or something, and I was able in six hours or whatever to go through like 10 different drafts because I was doing it in data log instead of taking forever. Um, but actually, desugaring. I would say the experience from doing this desugaring has been a little bit mixed, right? I've been telling you how great it was. We closed all these bugs. But it, it can have effects you don't quite realize that also have to do with versioning as it happens. 
in a way, um, which is sometimes your analysis might be more precise. You might be encoding things into your desugaring that you didn't necessarily intend. Um, so you have to be careful that your target is the right level of complexity. So here's an example. This is a match on some data. Um, but the interesting thing about it is not the match, but rather these guards. And so what this, what this guard will do is say, if foo is sum, I'm going to run this code and see if I should take this branch. And what that code does is it frees the vector. That's what drop does. So there's some vector on the stack up here. I'm going to free it. And then here, we'll say if foo is sum, I'm going to, and the vector is empty, then I should do this. But you can see there's kind of a problem. If we first ran the first test, we'll free the vector, and in the second test, we'll check if it's empty. That's obviously uh, not so good. Um, so we wouldn't want to accept this code for sure, and we don't. But what about if I reordered the arms? Um, well, let me go back one, one more iteration. What about if I just reordered the arms here? You know, then you could imagine, because the semantics is that we check the tests from the top to the bottom, sort of officially, that maybe we should accept it. Um, and what about if this arm was none? So this is a little trickier, because under the current desugaring, at least, what we would do here is we would uh, first switch on whether it's none or some, and that goes to two different branches of control. Right? And then we would go from there and handle all the some cases and all the none cases. And so we can see that, like, actually, this condition is over on one side, and the other condition's on the other, and they'll never both execute. So maybe we could accept it, but if we changed our desugaring, and there are cases where we have to because there can be exponential blow up from doing that kind of thing, if we change our desugaring, then we might find that now we can no longer see, um, and, and that we sort of have collapsed those two paths into one. Right? So we went from like two branches to sort of branches sequentially after another. So we kind of wanted, one thing we had to think about, and we, we added, basically the way we solved this was we added extra fake edges into our control flow graph. We had to actively think about making sure that we're not baking in things we don't want to bake in. Right? Um, and I think that arises, I've seen that in a couple other cases. Like, for example, in a grammar, uh, you might find that, indeed, your grammar is technically unambiguous, but if you add some new operators that you had intended to add, that would no longer be true. Um, Similarly, around cycle detection, I mentioned yesterday we, our compiler can will automatically detect cycles in its computation, and that's good, but that means it allows things that maybe don't cause cycles today, but maybe in future versions might cause a cycle. So we have to sort of think about that as well. Um, so, okay. Uh, all right, so the next thing I want to talk about is something we call Struestrup's rule, and what's happening is we're getting now into the areas of I kind of structured this from like clearer to less clear. We're getting now into things about syntax. And this is, of course, one of the most hotly contested topics. Um, it's, it's something we don't talk, we don't write a lot of papers about, but it comes up a lot in like actual work that we're doing, right? And so there's this rule that we, uh, we call it Struestrup's rule. I don't think Bjarne Struestrup calls it that, or even thinks of it as a rule, maybe. But I saw him give a talk, and he, ta and he said it. So I like, to, uh, I like to call it that. And it basically says that when you first add syntax to the language, people are, or a new feature, people are really suspicious of it. Right? They're like, what? What is this thing? It's going to make my code really hard to reason about. It's going to introduce a whole bunch of stuff I never had to care about before. I, don't, I want it to be like blinking red when it's typed in so that I know it's right there. But then after a while, they get used to it, and they're like, yeah, this is fine. Why is this thing so bright and red? Like, why don't you make it just one little sigil? Or why do I even have to type anything at all? Shouldn't it be implicit? Um, and so there's this evolution over time where people would like things to be loud in first and then quieter over time. Uh, and we've encountered this a number of times. And I think you can react to this in a couple different ways. I mean, one way is you can just say, well, sure, you're complaining now. I'm just going to make it quiet to start because I know you'll be happy after a while, uh, which might be true. Another way would be to say, OK, we'll start with a loud syntax, and we'll just migrate. Right? Um, so we did that around error handling. So Rust handles errors with this result type. And that's basically saying either it's a way to say in your return type that either the value was successful, 
that's the OK case. Or it was an error. That's the error case. And you can kind of bundle this up and say it was one of those two things and return it. So it lets you have an error code、um, as part of your return value. And a really common pattern then, so maybe I have some function that's going to process some data and it's going to return either an integer on success or some error in the error case.、Right? And a really common pattern、uh, when I'm invoking functions like this is that I want to. I want to kind of propagate. Oh, wait, hold on. Back. I want to kind of propagate the error.、Right? So here I have two functions process data and read data. And read data reads some data and gives it to you, or maybe gives an error. And process data then takes that data and processes it.、Right? And so a common pattern is that you would write something like, I'm going to match on the result of read data. And if it's an error, I'm going to propagate the error because. I have failed to read it. But otherwise, I'll process the data and do something to it.、Right? And if you've used Haskell, you will say this is a monad and you will be right.、Um, <laughs> uh, and so, this, this, this is really common. And what we were doing in practice, well, first we were writing things by hand like this, and that was really tedious.、Um, and somebody had the good idea of making a macro. And so, we made a little macro called try. And it would just encapsulate this match.、Um, do the match. If it's an error, return it. Otherwise, prop, pull out the data. And now I got to write my code in a sort of more natural way, where I, said, where I can say, let data equals read data, try bang. This is Rust's notation for macro invocation.、Uh, and then process it instead of having this whole match nested thing going on. And we had this for a while. And after a while,、uh, there were, we found some problems with it. Like, for one thing, it's kind of loud.、Um, It's got all these characters. But also, it was super annoying when you had like, long method call chains, because you'd like to say foo.bar, and then you want to process that.、Uh, maybe that returns a result. Then you have to kind of go back to the beginning of the line and type try bang in parentheses and come back to the end. And put the, and so these sort of things were starting to really irritate people.、Um, and so we, added, we, we proposed to add this operator, which you can see here, which is just the question mark operator. And it's basically the same as try bang, but it's built into the language.、Um, And this was one of the most controversial things we ever did. We now have one that is more controversial, ongoing right now,、uh, also related to postfix operators.、Um, but it, it was very controversial. It was a long discussion. And I think the only reason that it was even possible was because we had earlier unintentionally followed Struestrup's rule and introduced an explicit notation of try bang that was very loud, and nobody objected to that one. And that gave us enough experience to sort of argue for why we need this question mark that people could relate to. And they would say, yeah, I do like try, but it is kind of annoying.、Um, and you know, now, as far as I know, this is very, very popular. And、uh, indeed, many people who were against it have come up to me and said, I was wrong. Thank you for merging this.、Uh, so I think it was a good call. But, You know, we still are debating about the things, much like coherence. We're still debating about how to make this better and solve some other problems.、Um, but there was a lot of debate about, like, is it too small? Is it too subtle? Should it be a monad instead? Should we add do notation? And so on.、Um, and these are hard decisions. And so that brings me to the next one <laughs> that there's a lot of stuff that you have to reason about that's like, it's just not very binary, it's not right or wrong. Right? It's complicated.、Um, there are concerns on both sides, and they're both valid. And we've been trying, I think, over time to come up with sort of rules we can apply to help us do better than, well, it feels like the right thing.、Um, and so there's a blog post by Aaron Turan that I think I was rereading before this talk, and I was, I was going back over all the stuff we've done. And I, I really like how it set out. This particular, tried to handle one of these problems. So, what we were doing in 2017 was something we called the Ergonomics Initiative. We were looking at all the ways that Rust is really annoying, basically, and trying to fix them.、Um, and we had two aims. We wanted, to get, we wanted to make Rust nicer to use for people who are experienced, but also, very importantly, we wanted to look for things where new users would come and hit a roadblock and just bounce and, and stop using the language. Because what we had found was that people, Once they got over the hump and they sort of knew how to use Rust, they were very happy. But、um, we lost a lot of people on the way. And so we were looking for sort of win win situations where we can take what is 
to an experienced user just a like paper cut, but to a new user a possibly fatal problem and, and get rid of it. Um, and this was very controversial because it's exactly Strustrup's rule, I suppose, or I don't know, somebody else's rule of whenever you sort of take things, it seems like just making things that used to be very explicit implicit often raises a lot of fear. Um, and so what we, we were trying to figure out was, can we do better than talking about explicit and implicit? Right? These are things that people toss around a lot, and it, they mean very different things to very different to everybody. Um, but can we kind of decide when is it okay to make this notation more concise or less visible, and, and why? And so we, we wound up with three axes to think about when you're, when you're trying to weigh a decision like this. And one of them was applicability. So it basically says, how often does this come up? And how, how many places can you elide information? And is there some kind of way for you to know that information was elided or not? Right. Uh, another one is power. Like, how much does it really matter? Is this information important to understanding what the program, like, what effect it will have? Or is it kind of side information that maybe controls maybe its performance or something that's a little less central? And finally, context dependence, which is basically how much, how much do you have to know about the surrounding program to figure out what was elided? Right? Is it very local, or do you have to go look up structs or deeply measure things like that? And the idea is that all of these, ideally, all of these should sort of be small. <laughs> but if, if any one of them is very big, then the others should definitely be small. And if you find that they're all kind of big, that's probably a bad, uh, bad call. Um, and so we can go through some of the examples, like the question mark sugar. You know, you could use it in a lot of places, but it was explicit. There was still an actual question mark to see, so you knew that a return might be happening there. So we said its applicability is kind of small, but the power is pretty high because actually it can cause the function to return, right? It can completely change the control flow of the function. Um, and the context dependence was kind of medium because there actually is a little information. I didn't, I didn't go into all the details, but we have some ways to adapt the error types. So they don't have to be an exact match. So you have to know something more than just this local expression to know the full effect. You have to know the return type of your function, for example. Um, so it's kind of medium, not too high. And this, this felt like a good change, right? It had something very high, but the others were not high. Similarly, we do, we do function local type inference, which means that we, um, we, we require you to say the types of all your parameters and your return type, but within a function, we'll, we'll do pretty deep inference. And this is different than, say, Haskell RML, where they will infer things across functions. Right? And the reason was, before we had these criteria, was that we had basically experienced that it's, a lot, it's very confusing sometimes to have the body of one function, a, some change you make there leads to a type error in the body of another function. Um, and we wanted to avoid that. And we also wanted to avoid some of the sort of problems around recursion and so on, decidability and recursion. Um, and so, but looking at it through this lens, it, it kind of makes sense, right? So it has a pretty, uh, it's definitely not a low applicability. I guess I would call it medium or maybe even high because there's lots of types that get, that get elided. Um, but the power is also very high because it matters a lot what types you have. Um, but the context dependence, that's where we really ratcheted it down, right? By saying, you should be able to figure out from the, the surrounding code in your function and the things you're calling uh, what the types are, essentially. And you don't need to go and look into the body of other functions, right, um, to figure things out. So I think this is an example where it, 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 it helped us to understand. I mean, I guess we already sort of did, but it helped us to say it a little better. It's also an interesting one because um, I think you could argue, and I think it's true, these things are kind of all kind of high. There's nothing low here. And that's probably why type, conf type inference remains a thing that can be kind of confusing. Right? Even with these changes, plenty of people get confused about why is that the type of that variable? I don't understand. Um, and I think that makes sense. But it's also so freaking useful <laughs> that it's worth it. But. Uh, so that, that was sort of our rules for how to deal with ergonomics and so on. But one of the other things I've learned that's a little more uh, fundamental in some sense is that the things that you come across that are like what seem to be at first 
really insurmountable trade-offs that are just intrinsic to the problem are often not, really. I mean, there is probably a kernel of a trade-off there, but it's, it's probably not quite what you think it is. Um, so it's kind of like this, right? You, you think you've fully understood the situation, but then somebody comes along and suggests that, like, there's another side to it, another, like, third way. <laughs> uh, and I think the error handling is, is actually an example of this, right, this question mark operator. And many languages have sort of come to this conclusion that when we, if you look at error handling, the history of it, going back, you know, you first have like C or whatever, where you had explicit error codes, and they, they were very clear in some sense about what would happen in the case of an error. It's just a normal if, you could understand the semantics very clearly, but there was really wordy and it was easy to forget to use them and they had these problems. And so then I think it was in Clue at first, but exceptions were added and I think the premise there is, you know, you can't forget to use it, first of all, the error will propagate. And secondly, you get to look just at the happy path, and that's really good. But lately, there's been a kind of pushback because it turns out it, it can be hard to reason about code where random fun like where execution can just kind of stop any old place, and you have no sign that it's happening. And lately, I think a lot of new languages, so Rust and Swift, I think also Midori, which never saw the light of day, but was from uh, MSR, I guess. I think MSR, Microsoft Research. Um, have come around to this idea of, well, maybe we can go somewhere in the middle and have something that feels like exceptions, but, but there's some sigil, right? And it's, in a sense, it's kind of a third way. It seemed, I think it would be easy to conclude, well, you have to pick. Either it's totally explicit or it's um, totally focused on the happy path, and th those are the options. But actually, there's another way, right, where you can be a little bit explicit. And it, it feels like it, it, it steers a nice compromise. Um, and the whole premise of Rust, I think, is based on this. <laughs> Zero cost abstractions, they're the same kind of idea that you shouldn't have to pay a tax. Like, normally, you, you, you basically find in a lot of languages that the more abstractions you add, the more layers, the slower things get, right? And we would like to try to reverse that if we can. Um, that's the whole idea or of zero cost abstractions, is to say you can add these layers, but they're not actually going to make your code slower because they're going to compile away. Mostly works. Um, I think. It works very well for things where the API closely matches what you want to do, where it's less true is when the API doesn't let you do the efficient thing. But um, So I think I would say, you know, the fundamental trade-offs, they are there, but they're probably not, they may not be exactly what you think they are. Um, so I think in Rust Borrow Checker, we had threads. I would say this is another example, right, around threading, where it seemed to me that there was some kind of fundamental trade-off that you had to have either you take away sharing or you take away mutability, or you're going to have data races. Right? But it turns out you can kind of do a finer, more precise analysis and say you can have sharing or mutability, exclusive or, I guess. Uh, and then you can have threads and you won't have data races. Right? It's a little more refined. But it's not that it's totally free. We are trading something. We're trading complexity, basically. Because now we have a more complex predicate we have to think about and a language to reason about it. Um, and that may or may not be worth it. Right? Uh, so the way that I think there is a sort of systematic way to, to, to figure out these trade-offs and explore them. And it, it basically comes down to spend a lot of time thinking about the problem. <laughs> uh, but, but do it, I think, in a, you know, in a systematic way of trying to really get at what is the, the tension, what is the actual two things that are in conflict, and is there extra stuff around you know, this problem that you're just assuming is, is going to be true, and can you pare it away? And that usually, often that works best if you can bring more and more people into the conversation. Right? Um, and the last thing I would say is that when you when you're designing a language, at least, there's this tendency to think, oh, OK, I should solve. Here's a problem. I should definitely solve it in the language itself. We should extend the type system to tackle it, or we should uh, uh, come at it through one of those tools that we have available. But a lot of times, it may be that, you, that you know, somebody is bringing up a very good criticism of a feature, and it doesn't wind up changing the feature at all. It just winds up adding something to the side, like how does the error message phrased to lead people away from that problem? Or, can you have lints that maybe they don't detect it all the time, but they work good enough in practice? Um, and so there's a lot of things at your disposal, and right? it's a lot of uh, things you can tweak. And so 
I mentioned that a good way to get around the fundamental trade-off, figuring out what the fundamental trade-offs are, is to bring other people into the conversation. Right? And I think that has been very true for, for Rust. So one of the most kind of momentous things that happened, in my view, is that Yehuda Katz got involved and interested. And why that was momentous, this was in 2013. So Yehuda Katz is a, is a Ruby programmer. And he works on, or has worked on Ruby on Rails. He works on Ember.js, JavaScript framework now. And one of the reasons that that was really important was that the rest of us were C++ programmers. Um, and we had a certain mindset right, that, that we had brought from there. But, but Yehuda took a different view. Um, and I think kind of one of the best parts of Russ's like, message has been that oh, we want to try to bring together a lot of different strands, right? Uh, kind of like this, we want to take, if you, I don't know if you all saw this cartoon in your youths, probably not, but that's okay. We want to have sort of, yes, Rust people, but C++, JavaScript, academics, new developers, you know, all putting these, these ideas together and like bringing, uh, creating a superhero, I guess. I don't know, I'm getting a little carried away. Uh, <laughs> but you get the idea. Um, you know, greater than the sum of its parts kind of situation. And this is something that we call, or it's often called pluralism, right? And the basic idea is that there is not really a single authority uh, on what is correct. There's just a lot of them, and they coexist. Um, and it's not easy to do, right? So sometimes it feels more like this <laughs> than the superpower thing, where everybody's like really working hard for the thing that they love, and in the end result, yeah, you just sort of get nothing. Everybody falls down. Um, and so one of the trickiest parts uh, has to do with trying to convert it right, to be more like this, um, where this is sort of the feeling you get when that fundamental abstraction that you thought, that fundamental tension turns out to be less fundamental than you thought. You, you kind of get this pleasant surprise. Um, and so, oh, I have a lot of dog pictures. I forgot, I think I meant to take one of these out, but that's okay, I like this one a lot. <laughs> when it's all going right, it should be like this. Um, you know, where things are sort of all working together surprisingly well. Uh, so the, the trick, basically, to having this and not this, I don't claim to know what, really what the trick is, but I have some idea, and I think it is basically communication. Uh, so I think this will apply, in my view, this applies, you know, I'm talking about it from this side of big open source project and so on, but I think it applies to a distributed group, to any time when you have enough people together, um, which will happen in a lot of different contexts, right? And it's, it's basically, <laughs> I could say it a few more times, um, communication helps. A lot of times you have things in your head that are clear to you, but you're not really laying them out, or you have a vision for where you want it to go, and you might ask for help, but not clarify that vision, right? And the end result is you get things that aren't really quite what you expected them to be. Um, you know, they may take you a little bit by surprise. You say, oh yeah, I wanted you to figure out that feature, but mm, that's not what I had in mind at all. Um, so there's a few slogans that we have that I find really helpful around this, um, just to keep clarifying. And one of them is articulate the vision, uh, which is basically saying, you should figure out, take that high level view, of what you think your research is about, what you think your project is about, and put it out there, right? And make sure that you're, you're telling people. Um, and don't start from the bottom up, kind of, necessarily, but show the whole picture that you'd like to see. And I think in Rust, we have a few mechanisms for this. Um, things like roadmaps, where we try to plot out what we want to focus on over the next year and stuff like that, um, to, to show and articulate what is, our, what is our vision so that then other people can kind of synchronize up with us and, and, and align their objectives with the ones that we're trying to set, right? And one of the things that comes up whenever this happens, whenever we talk about sort of, this maybe is specific to, run, to running a big open source project, but whenever you want to get out there and ask for people to tell you what they think is important, there's a sort of a tension and a fear of like, but what if people suggest crazy things? What if I'm saying what I think is really important here and people don't agree with it? What am I going to do? Um, 
And I think what I've kind of learned is you just have to not be afraid of that. <laughs> you have, like, that's a good thing if people are telling you what they think, and you should be able to make your case. And if your case is, if you are correct, uh, then you know, it, people will listen. Um, and if you are not correct, then maybe you should listen, right? And there's plenty of times when I make a case and I realize, hmm, I think I was wrong, actually. So part of that, part of making a case then comes down to this other rule that we, we use, which we call no new criteria. And so the idea here is if you're having a debate, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bad thing that can happen when you've got a lot of people discussing something and a small set of decision makers where the decision makers read over the thread and they go to a meeting and they have a discussion and they come up with, they say, oh, these are some good arguments and here's some more arguments that we find, and these are really persuasive to us. So then they come back and they post the final decision, and they say, well, we decided to do X, we realized a lot of people wanted Y, here's our reasons, but these are new reasons that were never seen before. Right? And we had this happen in Rust, that's what the context of this quote, which I'll tell you in a second, was that <laughs> it's a very important decision. It, it actually is in a way. We were trying to decide what to call the integer type. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we used to call it int, and people didn't like this, because all the other types were called i32, i64. They didn't tell you they were related to the size, and int was, was, was not. And there was a lot of debate about if that was okay or not. And the truth is, we hadn't really participated deeply in that thread because we felt like, who cares? We have more important stuff to do, right? And then it, we felt we had to settle it. Um, and so we came in and we came up with our reasons and we posted them, but we never really engaged in that discussion, right? And there was a lot of pushback. And one of the pe people who pushed back wrote this that said, basically said what I just said. You never came to this thread. You didn't really take seriously our arguments. And you just posted a bunch of random stuff that is your conclusion and left it at that. That, that doesn't feel good, right? Um, and so what we decided to do was to go back. Right? We said, okay, we're not saying we changed our minds, but you're right, like that wasn't really fair. And we re-engaged, and in the end, we did change our mind. Um, and the, the types are now called I size and U size because they represent the size of a, of a value. Um, and I think that that's kind of come to be our process, right? That we use meetings and offline things uh, to explore the space, to take the arguments, to make new arguments, and bring those arguments back, or, exclusive or, to make a final decision maybe, you know, uh, but not both, not at the same time. And it, this is something you see in a lot of decision-making processes. You can often call it like a final comment period. That's another way to get about this. Basically saying it's important to give people time to point out why you were actually wrong. Uh, and the thing you thought was a killer argument is just ill-founded, um, because that happens. And one of the things I'm really interested in is now, which is related to that, is just trying to make sure that we understand everything. Right? So a lot of times there are really long discussions that cover a lot of different topics. And you might think, well, there's a long discussion thread, that's enough, that's documentation enough. But actually, it's really good to take and summarize all the things that were said in that discussion. Right? And that applies whether it's three people in a room or 100 people on the internet. Take it and bring it, skin some structure and the conclusions. And what I like to try to do is separate out sort of the facts that are relatively clear from the narrative, which is like why given these trade-offs, given this thing that's better and that thing that's worse, why I would pick this one decision, right? Um, it sometimes, uh, it works pretty well. Um, and I think while we're on the topic of communicating, like a really hard challenge if you're, if, has to do with basically allowing people to follow along. And if you want lots of people to be involved, you have to accommodate the fact that many people can't follow every minutia of your, of your design iteration. But they would like to come in at some later point and get an idea of what the big picture was, where are you, how are things going. Um, and that kind of progress and plans has been an interesting and challenging thing, trying to figure out how to communicate that, how much time to spend communicating that. Um, I think it's not something we do very well at right now. Like, if you don't follow closely, you can get lost. I get lost all the time, so even if you do follow closely, uh, and that's something that I think we hope we will improve. So the last thing I'll say, <laughs> good advice maybe, is people sometimes are really rude. <laughs>
and it's a shame. Uh, and, and we try to not encourage that, but if, if you find yourself in a situation uh, where you know, you're, you're debating with someone in this way, the thing that I found really surprisingly helpful is just to s pretend they're being nice. <laughs> Basically look, because a lot of times they, they're upset not because, uh, I mean, they're expressing themselves poorly, but there's often a reason that they're so upset. Right? Something got them that mad. And maybe it's reasonable and maybe it's not. But, um, but you should try to figure out what it is. And you should see if, indeed, they have some technical, like, if you're, if you're trying to make a technical decision, is there an actual good argument to be addressed? And you can address that. And what I would say is I think this rule applies if you're, like, the leader of an open source project, say, hypothetically. Maybe not so much if someone's yelling at you on Twitter, and you should just block them. Uh, you don't have time for that. But like, so that's this part, I guess. Um, but I think this is a this is also something that has applied to me in, in my life a lot. <laughs> Once I started trying to be calmer on the internet, um, I don't know. I remember walking down the you no know, driving down the street, and some guy came running up to me and was like, "Why did you pull out of your driveway so fast? There's a school over there." And I I don't know. I wanted to yell at him, and then I thought. You know, he's actually right. <laughs> so then I told him I'm sorry, and he went away, and it was great. So I don't know. I think this is like keep your calm and try to focus on what is actually being said and if there is something there. So the last thing I'll say, I think, is that a phenomena that, that happens, I've seen a lot uh, in in different open source projects, basically, but also in different parts of the project, uh, is that there's, there's decisions that seem really important, so important that you don't want anyone else to make them, but not so important that you should make them right now. <laughs> uh, they're not top of your list. And maybe that's OK. Like Maybe they can wait. But a lot of times, it would be better if you could just let people take that space and, and at least give them something to do in that space so that they can make it happen. Right? Maybe it's draw up a design document or a white paper or whatever. Um, and don't sort of get in the way of their being able to do anything at all. And I think failure to do this is often what leads to people being so angry a lot of times, right? because they're just feeling stymied and frustrated. So um, that, that kind of brings us to, I guess I would conclude this like, little section on pluralism by saying, my feeling is projects don't need a dictator. You should embrace that there's a lot of people with a lot of ideas. Uh, but I won't deny that like, it's super useful <laughs> to have someone who makes the final decision. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways to attack this, and I think it applies in a lot of places. But, um, but consider pluralism. So that's the last slide, uh, the last thing I learned. Anyway, thanks a lot. <laughs> How are we going to keep scaling? Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's actually interesting. I was telling someone, or a few people probably, that like I think our governance system has worked us, served us very well, but we've also grown to be somewhere between 100 and 200 people. I'm not exactly sure. I think 150, most of whom are volunteers. And you know, if you think about that as like a company, that's a fairly it's a non-trivial sized company, and we have zero managers and zero uh, sort of hierarchy and stuff like that. I mean, it's a lot of work, basically, to keep the system like that running. And I think we're working on how we can restructure things. And uh, I'm sure we'll have more slides about them. But I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what the answer is. I think part of it is mm, going to be that, luckily, we don't have to scale forever. Like, I think that the, Basically, I think we can slow down a little bit. Right? There, was, there was a period running up till now, we've been sort of trying to do all the things that we would need to do to get the language to be usable by and really adoptable. And at this point, we've sort of succeeded or failed. And I think we've somewhere in the middle, maybe. Uh, but but we, can, we can basically, the core things you really need to use Rust, the biggest blockers are done. And we're working on improving it, essentially. And so we can take our time a little bit. And that helps. Um, it gives us some breathing. Why does the question uh, you mentioned that you 
Yeah, we've been wondering about that a lot. Uh, I mean, we can't get, obviously, we've never been able to get a full number anyway. It's always an approximation. So one, you might think, well, it's probably proportional in some sense uh, to the code we can see. I don't know if that's true. But I think the answer is that we are getting more conservative, first of all. And secondly, that uh, we, we also get a lot of benefit from the nightly build system. So the way we have it set up, most companies test their, test their code on stable and nightly. Uh, and they'll let us know, basically, if we make a change, if we fix a bug and it breaks them. And, and we can either help them fix it or, or, or make it a warning for a while or something like that, or roll it back. Um, so we do get some feedback this way. And I think one of the things we've been looking at changing is how we can really sharpen that, actually, and get more feedback, like maybe make it easier for companies to put nightly into their CI or more automatic to report bugs. I don't know. Like you talked about um, posting tentative decisions and like for the session, but when, like, and what, how do you decide when to make a real decision? Oh yeah, it's a good question. How do we decide when to make a real decision? Uh, basically, there's two things. First, are new arguments being made on on a continuous basis? Are there like unknown questions that seem like they just haven't been fully played out? If so, we probably wouldn't make a final decision unless we think that the answer to that question doesn't matter. Um, and secondly would be sort of, are we satisfied with the options, right? If it might be that we just haven't found a satisfactory solution and we can defer the problem until later. I think that's been my, I didn't write it there, but the other sort of side of this is that it's a lot of times it's good to just wait. Uh, ideas come um, if it's not crucial and you're not satisfied. But. We think about it, you know, a lot <laughs> whenever we're designing anything, basically. Um, how we deal with it is basically that's, I mean, that's what these bug fixes often are. You know, it's hard to, the, the line between a soundness bug and a compiler bug is often kind of small. But um, so basically we would try to find some solution. We'll test it, see what is affected. Uh, a lot of times it's pretty simple, but sometimes it's subtle. Um, and try to push it through. And that's the one line we definitely won't break, right? So we have certain things we will do no matter what. And if it's a soundness bug, ultimately we plan to fix it. Uh, we do have some bugs that have been open for a while, though. So I think there's, there's a sort of real world impact question sometimes. Uh, but we usually, those are definitely priorities for us. What would you change that you need to do in a new language? Break. What would I change if we were? What would you do? So there must be some things you'd like to do that are just too big to change. There's a lot of things. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's hard to say for sure, but I think I would. I sometimes feel that we, like, I think it's good that we had all this iteration in the beginning. We were basically, in some sense, resisting adding the features we wound up adding, and I think we proved to ourselves that we really needed them to do what we needed to do. But. Uh, but I wish we could spend more time on sort of, I wish we had been able to spend more time really trying to improve the, the mental model, sort of make it as smooth and easy to learn as possible. And I think there are some things we could do. It's a little bit hard to know, because until you do them, you don't know. But don't, I don't know, I could give you specific examples. But like, I think I would try to make borrowing a little more of a mode, for example, so that as you access if you go through a reference to a field, like say a.b, and a is a reference, then b would also be borrowed. So it would be the equivalent of what today is ampersand a.b, um, which would be something like there's a term from o o ownership types in object-oriented languages like a viewpoint adaptation. I think it would feel a lot like that. And I think I would try to eliminate some things that exist today, like there are some toe stubs around. For example, you can have a reference to an integer, an ampersand u size, which is pretty much exactly the same as an integer. <laughs> like it cannot be mutated, uh, but it's a pointer, right? But a pointer is the same size as an integer, so it's really not a very desirable type to have. But it arises out of the composition because of the way that the 
pipe system is set up, and I might try to just make that not possible, because it often leads to these annoying mismatches where you have like, I've got a vector of pointers to integers, and I want a vector of integers, and now I've got to copy it over. Um, but I'm not sure exactly how I would do that. <laughs> uh, so. Thanks.